Genesis chapter 26. Let's wrap this thing up. Verse 31, And they rose up betimes in the morning. So remember, the Philistines, they're partying with Isaac at verse 30. So in the morning, they got up. So they spent the night there. They got up, rose up early in the morning. That's what betimes mean. Betimes, it means early. And swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away. They also confirmed their oath. They swore to each other. Because remember, the Philistines, the, their purpose of visiting Isaac was to make a covenant with him that they would be in peace with each other. Isaac, he sent them away, the verse says, and they departed from him in peace. So they were able to leave him in peace. No tensions, no issues. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came. So it just so happened later on at that same day, Isaac's servants came to Isaac and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water. They reported to him about the well that they dug up. Remember, the, weg, uh, the well they dug up was Rehoboth at verse 22, which means room or space. As they kept digging that well, they found water, they told him. And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Isaac, he named that well Sheba. Sheba means promise. It might have something to do because of verse 31. He made a covenant, a promise with the Philistines in the same area. And hence, that's the reason why the name of the city, so the well is Sheba, but the city, the region surrounding that well, he called it Beersheba unto this day. Beersheba, if you might recall, it means uh, well of promise. It means well of promise. Why would he call it Beersheba when we've already heard this name before at Genesis 24? Remember Isaac, he was dwelling in a region that was called Beersheba that time, or he was around that region. The reason why is if you return a couple of verses behind at verse 18, recall that Isaac was redigging the wells that the Philistines stopped up, and he was ca calling the wells by the names his father Abraham gave to them. So he's just renaming, he's just reviving the lost names that the Philistines have stopped. We're going to look at verse 33. Uh, verse 34, excuse me. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Esau, when he turned 40 years old, he got married. The two wives that he, have, uh, that he took to, uh, to marriage are Judith, and she's the daughter of a Hittite named Beri. He also married Bashamath, who the daughter of Elon. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Beri and Elon, both of them are Hittites. If you recall, Abraham's family, they're supposed to be a segregated group. They're supposed to be on their own. They don't want to mingle with the lost world, mingle with the pagans. They have to uh, have their own, basically, quote-unquote, pure bloodline, so to speak. Hence, Isaac was grieved at verse 35, obviously, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. He really grieved their minds, Esau's parents, Isaac and Rebekah. Recall that promise of segregation that Isaac even took seriously at Genesis 24. Returning to Genesis 24, Abraham made his servant swear that when his son Isaac gets married, it would not be one of the pagans in the land. So Isaac knows that full well when he got married, which is obvious why Isaac would take it seriously as well. Because he got married that way, 
he would want his children to be married that way. Look at verse five. And the servant said unto him, peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. Returning a few verses behind at verse three, verse three, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Okay, going back, going back. Fresh review, remember God drowned out the whole world. Then we come to Genesis chapter 9 and chapter 10. And I've already explained verse by verse there. God's intention was for the people to spread out, for them to spread out, now not come in unity together. People who tend to intermingle, it brings more unity. And then it doesn't cause that division or spreading out. So I already explained that was the purpose. Why? Because God knew that once a, the reason why God didn't want that intermingling is because they had that problem at Genesis 6. They were too much intermingling. So then God wanted to put a boundary. Okay, just don't mingle at all, basically. And then they started to do that again at Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel. So then God knew this wasn't working. So God's like, well, I can't drown out the whole world again. And people are doing this intermingling thing. I can see that. If I didn't put a stop in the Tower of Babel, we would have already had the Antichrist and then probably the years of tribulation and United Nations already. So I've disrupted their languages and that will go on for a couple thousand years until the year 2022, hopefully. <laughs> And that will be when Jesus comes. Of course, I'm just saying that as a joke. But the point is, God is thinking in his mind, this is only a temporary thing. It, uh, eventually, they're going to intermingle again. But during those couple thousands of years, I got to have a pure group. So what God did, he decided to start with Abraham as a brand new nation, as a clean group. However, what happened is within Abraham's family line, there were some of the people within his genealogy that did mixed marriages. So we're seeing the start of that at Genesis 26. Genesis 27 now. <clears throat> and it came to pass, that's a favorite phrase you can notice as we go verse by verse in Genesis. It's usually the word behold and it came to pass. Those are the two most common phrases, figures of speech you're going to find in the Bible. We already know what that means. It's just introducing the next part. It just so happened to be, or what happened later on. <clears throat> so what happened later on then? That when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, just so happened at that time when Isaac was getting up in years, his eyes were dimming. So his vision is not as clear as before. The verse already explained to you that he couldn't see. He called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, my son. And he said unto him, behold, here am I. So he summoned Esau, his oldest son to him. He called out to him and addressed him as my son. And Esau answered back, behold, here am I. Behold, meaning uh, paying attention to this part, introducing to what he's about to say. And he says, I'm here. Verse 2, and he said, behold, now I am old. Isaac says in return, behold again. So paying attention to this part, what you're going to notice right here now, that's the idea for behold now. I'm up in years. I'm old. I know not the day of my death. Esau, I mean, not Esau, Isaac doesn't know when he's going to die. Now, some commentators will incorrectly say that Isaac, he was actually dying. No, he's not dying here. He's not in a grave, serious, or ill condition. What's going on is he can't see. He's up in years. What would any person do at that time, especially if they inherit God's blessing? They're thinking about turning over the baton, right? He said that he's not dying. He says, I don't know when I'm going to die. That's what verse 2 says. 
So the commentators are not really paying attention to what they're reading. This is very common, not just in everyday life, but we'll see several examples of that in Scripture. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20. David, he is not old. He is very young, yet he doesn't know when he's going to die. He says, I could die any moment. However, he got to live, if my memory serves me right, 40 more years as king. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. <clears throat> Verse 3, And David swore mo moreover, and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved, but truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. John Wesley is another famous example. He usually uh, writes his own diaries quite often. <clears throat> He wrote his own epitaph, 32 years of age. <laughs> now, I don't know why he would think he would pass away, but somehow in his mind, he just thought that way. You might notice that your pastor here, now when I say your pastor onlineers, I'm not trying to be arrogant and saying that I'm everybody's pastors who's watching me online. I'm speaking to people in my church. So some people just don't have rocks for brains, okay? I don't mean to be rude, but that's just, you got to realize I'm teaching to my people here. So if I say you're a pastor, it's a term of endearment, all right? I'm their pastor, and they're my members. Um, your pastor here, he mentioned a few times that he doesn't know, or he just has this bad... Uh, <laughs> bad feeling that he's not going to last long. I think it's just because of the times that we're looking at and just uh, how much I'm getting preoccupied with things. So it is common and normal for people to do that because when you get into their shoes, when you're going through what they're, the predicaments they're going through, the trials and then the situation and the time surrounding them, it would be understandable why they would talk like that. John Wesley, he lived 56 more years after that, obviously. He didn't die. So this is a common saying for some of God's saints, especially if they're holding or inheriting a big thing from the Lord, which Isaac had, John Wesley, and David. And that's the reason why some pastors would talk like that. Some of the meanest things that, uh, I won't mention their names, but some of the meanest things that Bible-believing pastors who I respect and revere would have the audacity and would dare tell me that, uh, you know, I might not last forever. You guys have to carry on the baton. I hate that. You know, that's the meanest things that they could ever say. And some of you members probably say the same thing about your pastor when he says that too. <laughs> so I guess I can, I sympathize with you. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 3. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow. Isaac pleads with him. So he says, pray thee. That means uh, I urge you. I plead with you. He wants him, Esau, to take his weapons, his bow, and the quiver. For some of you who don't know, that's referring to this uh, holding thing that holds the arrows. <laughs> Whatever you want to call this. All right. So... Some, uh, this holding thing that holds the arrow. If that is such horrible English, but anyway. <clears throat> Verse 3, and go out to the field and take me some venison. He wants Esau to go out to the field. Bring back deer meat, venison. He wants him to hunt. <clears throat> and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me. Isaac wants Esau to make tasty, savory meat that Isaac loves. And then bring that tasty meat to Isaac so that he can enjoy his last meal, so to speak. That my soul may bless thee before I die. Before he passes away, his soul can be able to bless him. Usually that word soul is referring to something that's deep within him. So it's not just uh, him blessing Esau, but his very own soul. Soul is referring to the real you, the real person. That's the reason why when the word soul is mentioned, it's just simply a replacement for I. 
So it could be. So it's pointing out right here that I can bless you. But soul is much a uh, deeper meaning where it has to do something, the very depths of the real you. That's the reason why soul is better than just the word I. You're going to notice that at times. Isaac's problem, as I've mentioned to you over and over again, is the typical issues of a second generation Christian. I pointed that out to you. Isaac has a serious issue, even though we might take it as something minor. But a second generation Christian, if they're not careful, one of their fleshly weaknesses, and in this case we see it's his belly. It's something fleshly to his taste. That's just the one thing. Now, that doesn't seem big, right? I mean, let's be honest, uh, there are times that we shouldn't eat more than we should eat. There's something tasty that we see in the fellowship hall during Sunday church. And then, you know, after we get right with God at the altar, we just sin again, like uh, five minutes later with the food. So there are those times that uh, we just feel like I can eat an extra cake or an extra dessert, especially if you're out there. But the thing is, something small like that, and may not be something where we see as criminal, became something that has a huge detrimental consequence. Oh, come on, you know, eating a cheesecake, eating deer meat, it has a huge consequence. It's hard to believe, isn't it? That's the reason why that something where we see as minor as deer meat what does it affect the next generation? Not you, that's the problem. See that? You're looking at yourself too much. I keep trying to tell you that in our previous Genesis studies. The third generation. Well, we take things, quote unquote, moderately. We sin moderately, as if there's such a word, right? You know, there's nothing wrong with drinking. I get a lot of hate on that one online. You know, that's just so amazing recently. All right, there's nothing wrong with sinning moderately. You know, that's like, that's, there's nothing wrong with drinking moderately. So shows their, what's in their heart. They want to sin moderately. I don't like that. Anyway, I could say a whole bunch of things. There's just silly arguments. It's just so pathetic. But what can I do within a 60 second clip, huh? What can I do? I can't please satisfy everybody. Okay, but anyways, uh, I've just lost people watching me now. I don't care, okay? Anyways, in, our, in the third generation, Isaac's sin, it caused Jacob to lie, to deceive, and it caused his other son Esau to almost become a murderer. Just something small like that. What we do in moderation, the third generation takes it excess. It's just a little bit of TV, then the next generation will take it with excess. Just a little bit of skipping church. Oh, well, have you seen your children coming to church now? That's why we have to take this thing very seriously. This, uh, this is a very unhealthy cycle. Little things always create big things. Little things always create big things in times. It may not have an effect on you, but you have to think about your next generation. It has a huge detrimental consequence, and you cannot risk that. By risking these things, then it shows that you don't have much care about your future generations or your own children, which is sad. It shows that deep down inside you care more about yourself rather than your own child. But hey, we're living in that generation now. They could care less if they can murder their own, uh, their own baby nowadays, right? We're now living in that generation of complete selfishness from generation after generation, and it always goes from something small to something big. You have to think about your surroundings. You have to think about how you affect other people. And they will carry it on. They will carry it on. Remember, sin is not just affecting you. 
It always affects other people. It's not just you. It always affects other people. Let's look at the book of Romans chapter 5. This is a very good passage here about how one man's sin, it's eating. It's just eating a piece of fruit off a tree. He didn't commit murder. He didn't do something big. He did something small. And that sin affected the entire human race. We have to realize that what we see as petty or something small has a huge widespread consequence. Romans chapter 5. Notice that the Bible points out in verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is a free gift. For if the offense of one many be dead, let's keep reading down, look at verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, look at verse 18, therefore as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Look at verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. The point of all these verses is something that we might deem to be harmless had a huge widespread effect. Go back to Genesis. Returning to Genesis 27 and verse 5. Notice it affected Esau, where he almost became a murderer, Jacob, where he had to lie and deceive, and even his wife, where she had to go outside of God's will and do what she thinks is God's will and force things on her terms. So he made his whole family sin. You have to realize this. Your sin will make your whole family sin. Wow. Let's look at verse 5. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son. So Rebekah heard everything that Isaac said to Esau, his own son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. Self-explanatory, Esau went out to the field to go out hunting for deer meat so that he can bring it to his father. Verse 6, And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, that's self-explanatory, Rebekah speaking to Jacob her uh, her own son, and she says to him, Behold, I heard your dad speak to Esau, your own brother, and he said this, verse 7, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat. I heard your father saying to Esau, Bring me deer meat and make me meat that's very savory, it's tasty, so that I can eat it, and bless thee before the Lord before my death, so that I can bless you, in the presence of God before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that, uh, that which I command thee. Notice that Rebekah tells her own son Jacob, uh, now what you're going to do, my son, is you have to obey me. Follow what I specifically instruct you to do. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats. She wants Jacob to go to the flock that they have and then to fetch her that, no, that's not hard to understand. You still tell your dog to go fetch, all right? So that means to uh, catch and bring it back. Thence would be like there and uh, over there, so to speak, to uh, kids of the goats. So that's ba basically meaning uh, baby goats. And I will make them savory meat for thy father. She's going to make these uh, baby goats into tasty meat for Jacob's father, such as he loveth, as he would love. Now that's uh, very interesting right here. What's very interesting is that it's not genuinely dear meat. It's fake. And then Isaac would love that. You know what 
you got to realize your moderation, second generation Christian, is actually fake. And you would still love it. The devil, he doesn't have to give you the genuine article for what you want to do moderately. He can give you something fake and you would be so blind to follow and believe it. That's the reason why you have to watch out for that sin, that fleshly issue of yours, because something so small could be something deeper. Something so small that you do can actually expose you a deeper issue that you have. You have to take a look at yourself. Let's keep reading here. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat and that he may bless thee before his death. So Rebecca instructs her son Jacob to bring the savory meat to his father so that he can eat it and that he can bless Jacob instead before he passes away. Rebecca has a problem here that a lot of women do go through. First of all, we're going to go to Genesis chapter uh, 25. Genesis chapter 25. What's important for women, which is very hard to live a life of submission under the husband, is that they don't trust their husband. Well, good, you shouldn't. <laughs> I tell my wife that all the time, too. But what's very important to understand is if you think that way, I've got to trust my husband. I've got to trust my husband. It's so hard to trust my husband. That's why I can't listen to him. Then you'll never live under a life of submission. Okay. Period. Never, ever. Evangelist Ionello gave a great testimony, right? That he was a wicked man, a lost man. But look at him becoming a great preacher. But it didn't come without long lengths of time from his wife who first got saved. And his testimony was that in spite of being a very bad husband, she was told that she's got to live a life of submission. That's what she learned as a good Christian. So she did that. It won her husband's heart. And then he worded it as she was able to love the unlovable. He got, sa uh, he got saved. He became a preacher. Wife meant so near and dear to his heart, she died with cancer, you might recall. One of the hardest moments in his life. But that carried him on for life, permanently. And he brought something to our church where it helped us carry us on during our lowest moments, right? Yeah. We have to remember this. We have to remember that this one woman changed pretty much a part of a historical timeline, perhaps. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Because she lived a life of submission. Someone we don't know from Adam. Did she trust her husband, believe her husband? No, that's where you fall. See, even a husband can mess up or be wicked. You have to trust God. Yeah. Now, if she recalled what God promised her, then she would be able to live a life where she doesn't have to take control over her husband, just let the husband do his own thing, and who knows what God would have done. Maybe, maybe just dropped Esau dead on the spot, or maybe Isaac would have changed his mind, or God knows, send an angel down from heaven. I don't know, but the point is, is you ladies got to trust God. You don't know what the scenario will play out. But because you always picture and imagine and worry about how the scenario will play out because you know your husband, his tendencies, he wants that deer meat, he will bless Esau. There's no way in hell he's going to bless Jacob because I know my husband. Okay. He is a fat pig. He just wants the deer meat. <laughs> he, don't, he could care less about his younger son or the promise of God. Okay, now I'm... <laughs> Now, I'm talking like this so because deep down inside, you women are thinking like that and feeling like that, all right? You may not say that out loud to your husband unless you get in a fight, you know, but deep down inside, that's all bottled up. 
and it's swimming in your mind and, you're, and all these negative things, suspicions about your husbands are coming out. That's the reason why the Bible says how the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, right? See, it's, it's the heart is so abundantly flowing with that. But the point is, uh, returning back to my explanation, the point is she has to trust in God, not think of all these imaginary stuff and suspicions or confirming the suspicions about the weaknesses and the tendencies of the husband. By doing that, then you cannot live a life of submission or faith, period. And you're going to even miss out the promise of God. This is very tragic and sad. Um, I'll explain later on when I comment further, but Rebecca did go through something tragic. If we go to Genesis 25, verse 22, and the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. God gave a promise. Jacob will inherit the promise. She should have just walked out by faith. But no, she went by feeling. She went by sight. That's very important to watch out for. I think it was a missionary, Gabe Cochran, who mentioned this is that we run by five senses we don't go by the spirit wow. and that's the reason why we always sin and mess up we have to see feel taste uh, something that reaches our five senses for us to keep serving God rather than blind faith just going by how the Holy Spirit leads so that's really good stuff there should be a whole sermon on that one that I might do one day but it's really good stuff there. That's a lot of truth. If we were to return to Genesis chapter uh, 27, 27, we see that uh, Rebecca took uh, the reins herself. She could not trust the Lord, and that became her downfall. She couldn't stand on the promise of God, so to speak. If you stand on the promise of God, there is no fear. But if you don't stand on his promises, you're standing on your own two feet and you have every reason in the world to constantly worry and to fear. A life like that is not a happy life. A life like that, you will gain no peace. It's a horrible life to live in. Taking control of something yourself is the worst scenario that you can put yourself into. You have to completely yield to this spirit and relinquish. You have to relinquish control and let God. This is the favorite passage that a lot of women claim as their promise. Rebecca didn't claim this promise. Go to Philippians 3. Philippians 3. If she did this, then she wouldn't have taken control herself. Philippians 4, excuse me, Philippians 4 and verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6. Yeah. Here is Rebecca behind the scenes being so cautious, paranoid. What's going to happen? I'll take, I got to make sure Jacob does this right. He better get that blessing. She, for, she forgot what the scriptures mention. Don't be careful. Be careful for nothing. So don't be careful at all. She could have just let go of everything and be at peace. But no, she couldn't. She had to be careful. She had to be full of care. Verses, be careful for nothing. But in what? Everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. She should have turned it over to the Lord in prayer. It's very simple. When you see or hear a fault from your husband or sin around you, the tendency of that woman is to careful and then take control herself. The very first instinct that you should do is to immediately pray. Amen. It's to immediately pray, relinquish control, 
Trust everything in God's hand. Every feeling that you have bottled up, you say it to the Lord in prayer. Amen, just, just say it to the Lord in prayer. You don't have to uh, vent it all out against the husband or do something yourself that you're going to regret permanently in your life. You got to give it and surrender it to the Lord in prayer. Everything. And then in verse 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. God's going to fill you up with this peace and your mind and your heart is not going to be on your husband. It's going to be on God. Now, notice where Rebecca's mind was. It wasn't on God. If, she, if it was on God, she would have remembered the promise. And then she would have walked by faith. All right, let's go back to Genesis 27. Genesis chapter 27. We're going to look at verse 11. Verse 11. Now, this is a horrible thing to do. When women take charge, it can be a very scary thing. <laughs> it can be a very scary thing to the point of madness. Why? Because she cares about her child. If you want to see a woman's emotion cut unleash, it has to do with the child she deeply loves and then see her go all out. You want an ugly church split? A simple little fight in a playground with one mother's dear child versus another mother's dear child. And then you'll see the most ugly church split in all of history. Just see that happen. Just see that help happen. Uh, you don't believe me? Uh, give it five years with Sister Sydney and Samantha and we'll see what will happen. <laughs> All right, let's go to... Let's go to verse 11. <laughs> and Jacob said to... <laughs> I had to put a little humor in there. It was just so dead right now, you know? I had to put a little humor in there, all right? All right, verse 11. <clears throat> and Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Jacob responds to his mother, Rebekah, uh, Behold, so it's like, hey, right? So the idea, again, I'm not going to repeat, is to pay attention to this part. It's introducing this part. Esau, my, uh, Esau his own brother, is hairy. And, but Jacob, on the other hand, he's very smooth. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall see to him. Uh, I shall seem to him as a deceiver. It, it's possible. That's what peradventure means by chance, or it's possible that my father is going to feel me, and then gonna find out that I'm a. I lie to him, and I will appear to him. I will seem to him as a trickster, and I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And then dad's going to curse me. I'm going to get myself a curse, not a blessing. Mm -hmm. The worst thing any mother would say, but that's what happens when you run by emotions. It's not rational. You say and do the most tragic things. A woman could do this if she doesn't keep her emotions in point at verse 13, especially with the child she deeply loves. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. No, you do not want to say that. You never want to say that. The mother, Rebecca, says to Jacob, Upon me, let that curse fall on me. Just listen to what I say. Just obey me and fetch me those baby goats. That's horrible. You know what happened? If you, yeah, she's never mentioned in the Bible after this incident. Talk about a curse. Um, another thing is, uh, what was I about to say? So, so because she's not mentioned in the future in the Bible, you know who's the one that was mentioned though in the future? Isaac, the one who thought he was going to die, but not Rebecca. Ja Jacob got to meet his daddy again, but not his mommy. That's horrifying. Why? Because this is important. This is not just women, but this is generally to people. 
A person, when they are full of care, and then they forget to surrender to God in prayer, then what's the tendency? The tendency is to take control. And the worst part is, you think you're spiritually right with God. You know what I think? I think Rebecca believed she was right with God when she did that. You might say, why is that? Because God made a promise to her. It's going to fall on Jacob. So in her mindset, I'm following what God would want. No, you're not. You're not. But that's the excuse of every Bible-believing pastor or pastors nowadays where they feel like they're doing the work of God, uh huh. but then because they're always careful and they haven't surrendered to God in prayer, the tendency is to take control then. And then when you take control, then you do things, you control. That's a horrible word. You control things while being deceived and blinded, while thinking the same time, I'm in the will of God. And that's why I'm going to put quotes here, because you're not under the will of God. Well, I'm doing this for you, God. You know, the number one statement that God's going to be sick and tired of hearing at the judgment seat of Christ. Dr. Upman mentioned this in his Adler commentary. The number one thing that God will be sick and tired of hearing at the judgment seat of Christ when they failed to do this work or they compromised on this or did this thing, but I've done that for your glory, Lord. Oh, God is sick and tired of hearing that. Same old story, same old story. You people don't get it through your heads. That's why all these pastors compromise. Get bigger crowds, more souls saved or... Stuff like that. Why? For God's glory, for God's glory. Same old story, same old story. God don't want that. Now, this is one of the most dangerous things. You don't want to end up like that. And the worst part, okay, I haven't hit the worst yet. The worst part is while you're controlling things while under the will of God, when consequences happen, uh-huh, you're willing to take them. Now, this, can, this is a good thing, but it's a horrible thing as well. It's one thing where you commit a sin and you accept the consequence of your sin rather than whining about it, right? So you have to be doing that as a Christian. You get what you deserve. But a horrible thing is when you know full well that your action yeah. is going to give you that consequence, you don't care. So actually, I should say not consequences you accept, consequences you don't care. So in other words, you don't care about burning in hell forever when you reject Jesus Christ. I've actually talked to these type of people. They actually exist. Phenomenal. It's unheard of. I said, well, if you burn forever in hell without dying, I mean, you're willing to go through that if you're wrong? Yes, I am. I went through hell, and I can do that. I'm like, no, this is burning forever. I mean, you're feeling that pain consistently, not just, uh, you know, in war where you can have breaks in between, even in the middle of uh, a Vietnam War. I mean, this is consequently feeling that pain. I mean, uh, constantly feeling that pain all the time. But they don't care. People just don't care and still insist in doing their thing and let me take the curse, the fallout. And at the same time, you think you're right with God. That is the most horrible thing ever. You don't want to be that type of Christian. You know who are these types of Christians? Onliners. Onliners, these weirdos who attack this ministry and what we're doing for the Lord and even the other Bible-believing preachers and churches that we're friends with, they have the audacity to criticize. I mean, it's a wonder God's curse is falling on them, and they don't care. They post a video, a sob story, I'm just being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Baloney sandwich, man. And you know it, fool. You know it, watching online. These people, the audacity. They don't care if they go through cancer. 
They don't care if they lose their church. They don't care if people think that they're a weirdo cult. But they care about getting a strike on YouTube. On, so then they behave themselves after that. It shows who your God is, you fool. Yeah. And you accuse me of, oh, uh, I'm, try I'm caring about YouTube and trying to get good reputation. What about you, fool? Why don't you get another strike for Jesus, huh? Yeah. Oh, YouTube controls your life, doesn't it? speaks volumes to me these people they have no they have no idea why I, why I monetize why I post the shorts why I do the things that I do in my subjects and teachings and guess what I'm not going to explain myself you don't deserve that I'm going to maybe explain it if I have to one day but I don't I refuse to do that right now when I'm teaching the word of God that's why I never had the luxury of time of posting videos, defending my reputation. I let God take care of them, and they could care less when they get cursed by God. That's sad. That's tragic. Now, here are several passages that will demonstrate. You wouldn't believe it. Go to Acts 21. Acts 21. Didn't you know the Apostle Paul was like that? That's phenomenal. The greatest Christian who ever lived actually committed one of the most dangerous things in his life. Look at Acts 21. Now God told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Told him through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit forbade him. Acts 21.4 And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Do you see that? Through the Spirit, don't go. Now look what Paul responds. Oh my goodness. Look at verse 11. The consequence is given to Paul. The consequence in verse 11. And he, when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So Paul's going to be imprisoned. Look at Paul's answer at verse 13. Ain't this pious? Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. God ain't proud of what you just said right there. God ain't proud. That's the problem with these false prophets, and then they just use these slick little words, acting all pious. Oh, I'm being persecuted for Jesus. Oh, I'm just doing the work of the Lord, and... You know, they act all harmless, innocent, nice, polite. And then they think that yours truly is just so mean, so critical. Whatever, man. You know what God hates the most is false piety. Okay. God hates that. This false piety, acting, pretending you're so spiritual, but you're not following God, the Holy Spirit. That's one of the things that I hate the most is this false piety garbage. Go to Judges. That's why I kick false pastors really hard some of them i can call their game i can see what they're doing and then they deceive the simpletons because they just see the manner of speech as long as you use the right words i am willing uh, i am not only willing to be in prison but even die for the name of jesus and then the onliners like oh rush of emotion and like like subscribe comment and then yours truly. How dare you? You're just so mean. <laughs> Blind. Man, how horrible, man. That's just horrifyingly sad, man. Okay, look at the book of Judges, and we'll look at chapter 17. Chapter 17. Look at what the mother said at verse 2. Judges chapter 17 and verse 2. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, and I took it. Notice that the man says, uh, I stole the eleven hundred shekels of silver. And then the mother said this, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, obviously, God's not pleased with that. But notice this statement where she's uh, thinking that I'm doing the will of God by doing something wrong. 
That is one of the worst things you can ever do in your life. Don't ever do that. Go back to Genesis 26, 27. Especially uh, not caring about the consequence. Taking the consequence. Oh, let me take it. I don't care. No, you're just stubborn. You're not being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You're just stubborn and arrogant and full of pride that not even if God split your head in half, you're so filled with pride like Lucifer, you could care less about burning in hell forever like Lucifer. And he still keeps rebelling against God. That's what you are. You're demon-possessed, full of the devil. Wow. All right, let's go to Genesis 27. Genesis 27. And then we'll look at verse uh, 14. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. So Jacob, he went out and then he fetched. So he caught it, brought back the baby goats to his mother. The mother made tasty meat <clears throat> the way that Isaac would love it. And verse 15, Rebecca and Rebecca took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. So Rebekah took the best uh, clothes that her oldest son Esau was wearing, and she had them with her in the house. So maybe she was uh, uh, cleaning, you know, that's very possible. Usually mothers would clean their children's clothes, so it's very likely. And then she put them on Jacob, the younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. Rebekah put the skin of the baby goats on Jacob's hands and the smooth part of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. That's self-explanatory. She gave the tasty meat, also bread that she prepared, and uh, put into the hand of her son Jacob. So Jacob held those things in his hand and is on his way to deliver the meal to his father. Now notice that Rebecca, she is no doubt doing these steps. She is so, she's very clever. She knows that uh, she has to put the garment on Jacob she makes sure to put the skins of the goats, like killing two birds with one stone. You get the meat. So she, Jacob didn't have to go deer hunting. She took the goat meat in a way where it would taste like the meat that Isaac would love, at the same time taking the skin and putting them on her son Jacob so that when Isaac smells or feels Jacob, he could think that it's Esau. Notice that, uh, look, women, we, we don't doubt that a lot of times you might have a lot of good ideas. <laughs> easier to say than to do, right? As a husband, maybe. But the thing is this, you women have to understand, look, you might have a lot of good ideas, but it doesn't justify what you do. You're still outside of God's will. Never, ever go by how great your idea is. Bad idea, I'll say it to you. Bad idea. When it's outside of the will of God, it doesn't matter how good your idea is. I mean, she covered all her ground. Not just women, but also, like I mentioned before, any Christian who tries to do something outside the will of God. And when they do these things, they can have all their plans, all their ducks in a row. Pastors can especially do that too, and they're good at it. They're good at it. But it doesn't matter. You, if it doesn't follow God, then you're following these steps like Rebecca and bad idea. Bad, bad idea. Your whole ministry is a lie. Okay, That's good. okay let's go uh, back to our text. Verse 18. And he came unto his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? Jacob goes to his father Isaac. And then he calls out to him, Dad. And then Isaac says, uh, I'm here. Who are you, my son? So he, he can tell it's his son. So already there's a suspicion right here. He doesn't know who his son is, though. But he knows it ain't Esau. So the only person he's thinking about in his mind is obviously Jacob. <laughs> and Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. 
Jacob says to his father Isaac, I'm Esau, your firstborn son. I've done everything that you uh, told me to do. Now, badest is the same thing like bid. It's like a past tense of bid. And the definition of that is order, command. So I've done everything you instructed me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison. So Jacob tells his father, please get up. So we can guess right here that uh, Isaac is obviously uh, lying down. So he's lying down. Jacob wants him to uh, sit himself up out of bed. And then he beseeches him. He urges him. He requests him to sit down and to eat of his deer meat. That thy soul may bless me so that you can bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? Isaac says to Jacob, his son, How is it you found it so quick, my son? Now, it's like he wants to say Jacob, you know. <laughs> but he keeps calling him my son. And he said, Oh, oh, because the Lord thy God brought it to me. You see what Jacob did? He lied through his teeth. False piety, that's self-explanatory. He's saying, because God's the one that gave it to me. Now, you notice the sin here. It's an ugly cycle. You notice how Rebekah's sin affected Jacob? Jacob did the exact same thing, all of this. Now, notice this third-generation Christian. Isn't it interesting? They follow all the sins of not just one parent, but both. Did you notice that? He's using false piety. Oh, because God's the one that... Watch out for that, man. If the worst thing, one of the greatest things that angered me the most, which is why I get on false pastors really hard, and these online, uh, these online channels who pretend to be great Christian le leaders, is because I can smell a rat, man. I can see that false piety. And you're hiding it all with arrogance and pride and selfishness. It just ticks me off. And you use scriptural wording, you know, spiritual wording. Because the Lord thy God called me to do this, to uh, make a video exposing Gene Kim, saying this kind of stuff. And blah, blah, you make me sick. Most of all, you make God sick. And you know it, but perhaps... You just blinded yourself where you're thinking, I'm under the will of God. You, that don't happen naturally. That can only happen when you follow the lust and you violate and disobey that so many times and you don't take care of that weakness. And you know it. You know it. God be with you till we meet again. Let's close with a word of prayer. <laughs> Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been sobering, that we won't follow these uh, sins, and that we'll be very careful, Lord. The devil is very sneaky. The flesh is so creepy, Lord. The flesh is so subtle. It's, uh, let us not succumb to its weaknesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.